Hello and welcome to episode 204 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian, and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. With me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other assignments. How are you this morning, Bill? I feel like we're going to go feet dry to use the Navy expression today, Seth. Indeed, we are. And as you can probably see, we have our return guest and good friend, historian John Parshall. How are you this morning, John? I am absolutely great. Fantastic. Fantastic. We got some interesting stuff to talk about today. The term forgotten theater, forgotten battle, forgotten front, what have you, is an oft utilized moniker for a topic of the war that doesn't get the proper attention it deserves. Usually that forgotten title is applied by someone who thinks that the story of the fumigation and bath companies working ashore on Green Island in 1946 is a forgotten front of the war and also important, but I digress. When it comes to the Pacific theater, one can tag a lot of places as forgotten, quite frankly, most of the places. However, one stands out among the rest when it comes to events that are often overshadowed by others that occurred simultaneously or have taken on greater historical importance. That Forgotten Campaign is one that consumed the lives of about 11,000 Allied soldiers, 7,000-plus Australians, and 4,684 Americans, as well as an astonishing, get ready for this, 202,000 Japanese. That place is New Guinea. The New Guinea Campaign, like Guadalcanal and later the Philippines, was not a one-and-done operation. Fighting in and around New Guinea occurred from 1942 until the end of the war in 1945. Campaign began on January 23, 1942, when the Japanese invaded Papua and New Guinea, and by March of that year had advanced mercilessly over western New Guinea and were threatening the area around Port Moresby. Japanese were obsessed with the capture of Moresby for the majority of the year 1942, so much so that they diverted supplies, men, and material from the crucial Guadalcanal campaign to the area around, area around Moresby, much to their detriment. New Guinea was a unique campaign and one that we will visit often throughout the coming seasons of this podcast, as it consumed massive amounts of men and material and some of the most inhospitable locales on the planet. Rife with tropical diseases, monsoons, and many more life-threatening situations, not the least of which was flying lead. It was a campaign that saw the Australians valiant, valiantly fight for their very national lives and, like Guadalcanal, proved to be a schoolhouse for various U.S. Army units and proving grounds for various men and their flying machines. Today, we're going to dive into the background of the New Guinea campaign and specifically focus on the Australian and American efforts in late 1942 and early 43 to capture the area around Buna, Gona, and San Ananda. With that very long introduction, gentlemen, let's get on it. So... As I said in the intro, the, the uh, campaign began early in the war, really. Um, the Japanese were the first ones to instigate the action. John, what, what can you tell us about these first intrusions? Well, you know, just from a strategic standpoint, I view Japan's fascination with Port Moresby as yet more evidence of their strategic bankruptcy, that this is a military that just really didn't have a good idea of what the heck it was doing at the strategic level. Um, Port Moresby sits on the southern coast of New Guinea, and it's practically impossible to get to. Uh, Japanese wanted Moresby because they knew it could be built up into a bomber base that could then be used against them at places like Rabaul. Mm -hmm. But from a from a, a disciplined, you know, how do we select the objectives that we can actually take and hold sort of perspective? Moresby is just, a, a, it's a cul-de-sac. Right. The only way you can get to it is either around the eastern tip of New Guinea through the Louisiade archipelago and running supplies in via sea. That's going to be difficult because, of course, you know, the Australians have air power in northern Australia that can be used to hit you. or uh, the second part of the campaign where they try an overland thrust uh, via the Owen Stanley Mountains, they think that they can keep it in supply uh, via the land, which is going to be shown to be absolutely ludicrous. So, you know, you can kind of look at this as, as six months of idiocy on the part of the Japanese and trying to seize an objective that it could never have used to its real advantage and which sucked up an enormous number, uh, amount of resources in the process. Mm -hmm. 
and it violated it's, what we would call the principle of mass, which is one of the principles of war, because as you said, Seth, they're simultaneously trying to deal with the Guadalcanal situation. Mm -hmm. So they right. end up having insufficient mass at both locations, which then makes kind of the outcome inevitable, but it doesn't make it quick. Right. No, I think that's very good. Yeah, good analysis there. As we'll see as we get get through this, you know, the Japanese, for all their desire to capture Port Moresby and to make New Guinea this bulwark of, of Japanese presence here in the South Pacific, they didn't really put the effort through fully to 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 do it because they were so preoccupied on Guadalcanal. And that right. includes air power, sea power, and obviously manpower. And it, it and it's amazing as to how much Guadalcanal. You know, we say this, and we, you know, we're not going to get into it here, but it's, it's how much Guadalcanal affected everything else, including this operation, which you, John, I believe, said at one time that the Japanese viewed these as the same, or at least you know, yeah, kissing cousins yeah. of the same operation, twin heads of the same monster, in, in essence, and. You can sort of see from a, a larger perspective, if you look at the, the string of Japanese possessions that, that you know, run in this giant arc through the Malay barrier. So you've got Sumatra, then Java, then um, Bali, um, you know, and then running further, uh, further to the east into New Guinea. It makes sense, you know, when you look at them from space, you know, there's this giant set of barrier islands. The problem with New Guinea is it's, you know, it's the largest island in the world, and it's bisected by the Owen Stanley Mountains, which means that getting to the southern coast of New Guinea is not a trivial exercise. A lot of people don't realize that the Owen Stanley Mountains are as tall as the Rocky Mountains, okay? They are covered by triple canopy jungle. Um, so they are stinking hot and humid during the day, but they go down to, you know, bone chilling temperatures mm -hmm. at night. The Kokoda Trail that goes between the northern coast and Port Moresby goes up over 7,000 feet to get across these things at Templeton's Crossing. So, and the train is just ludicrously difficult. Mm -hmm. um, these mountains are extremely heavily rained upon because the precipitation here is north of 200 inches a year. So the erosion is incredible, which means that you have this series oh of razor sharp ridges, yeah. you know, running north to south. Uh, there's one sec section of the trail close to Ower's Corner called the Golden Stairs, which was literally a thousand logs chopped out of this near vertical stair, you know, hillside that the Australians in many cases had to crawl up hands over knees to get to the top of this ridge. This is not the kind of thing that you can run supplies over. Right. So well, at least not more than that. I've anyway. got yeah. sorry, I've got a doctrinal question for you, John. When when we yeah. talk about the Japanese Navy, we, you know, we we talk about the, their focus on proper focus, in my opinion, on Mahan. When you talk about the Japanese army here, you know, I mentioned the principles of war, which and they violated the principle of mass. That is not Clausewitzian. But one thing that is Clausewitzian is the principles, is the Clausewitz principle of center of gravity. Mm -hmm. Now, Guadalcanal became, wasn't initially, but became a center of gravity for us. Rabal was certainly a center of gravity for them. Yeah, Port Moresby didn't seem to be a center of gravity for anybody. Did they just not understand the concept or were they not Clausewitzian in their approach to doctrine? What you end up seeing is this tendency throughout the early part of the war where the Japanese would capture something like a Rabal, which clearly was a very mm -hmm. important base. And then they would say to themselves, well, we need outposts to defend Rabaul against attack. So we'll go and grab Ley, we'll go and start building this airfield on Guadalcanal, and these outposts will, you know, defend Rabaul. But then, gee, it turns out that once you got these outposts, they need outposts to defend them against attack. And so you get this sort of self-fulfilling, you know, momentum. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, in the early part of the war, of course, the Japanese were essentially punching into air in that the Allied defenses were nowhere near being ready to, to face up to them. And so, the, again, there's a real lack of discipline on the part of the Japanese and being able to say, 
this is what our perimeter is going to be, and we're going to stop here. Anytime mm -hmm. there was an opportunity that was afforded to them that, well, but we might be able to grab this place on the cheap, they went for it. And Moresby, to my mind, is a perfect example of that. They, they were obsessed with the, the whole thought of Port Moresby, because if to the listener, if you hear the name Port Moresby, you should be thinking about the Battle of Coral Sea in May 1942, right. because... That is initially why the initial, the Battle of Coral Sea even occurred in the first place. It's because the Japanese were sending an invasion force bound for, wait for it, Port Moresby. Yeah. So this whole this mm -hmm. whole obsession with this one locale, I mean, you know, if you look at it on a map, you can kind of see, you know, why they wanted it. But to your point, John, it's almost impossible to keep it in supply. It's almost impossible to really defend it unless you put a lot of dudes there. And even if you do, those guys are essentially cut off yeah. because of that spine that's running down the middle of the island you know in stanley mountains now Correct. to that to that they, point they didn't seriously think they were going to threaten australia from port moresby did they no and that's a common misperception uh in australia at this time there was a belief that they were set sure. up being set up for an invasion but the japanese themselves yeah. never wanted to invade australia yeah. by the way our australian listeners and we've got an incredible number of them are, are, I hope, very happy because this, this show, in, in part, is a response to everybody reaching out and saying, hey, look, we were in the war, too, right? So Absolutely. don't forget us. Absolutely. And they sure were. But there's this other perception that Australia was consumed by the Brits pulling them into the European theater and didn't have the force necessary to deal with their own Island, big island defense. Is there any truth to that? Um, what, what you had seen at the beginning of the war was that both uh, Ninth Australian and Sixth uh, and Seventh had been posted. First, uh, Ninth went to the UK. The other two divisions went to um, the Middle East, mm -hmm. and Eighth Australian Division uh, ends up in Malaya and is destroyed in the course of the Malayan campaign. So then what ends up happening is uh, Prime Minister John Curtin uh, basically tells Churchill, we're bringing our forces home uh, to defend Australia. And there's a lot of, you know, kind of shenanigans. Uh, at one point, Churchill surreptitiously was trying to send the 7th Australian Division to Singapore, where it too would have been destroyed at the tail end of that campaign. Basically, what ends up happening is the Americans cut a deal. They say, look, we'll kick in two of our own divisions to help defend Australia if you guys will leave 9th Australian in the Middle East uh, to, to keep up the campaign there. So around this time, which, you know, let's start the narrative in July of 1942, you have 7th Australian Division has now made it back to Australia, but the bulk of the Australian forces in New Guinea are territorial defense right. battalions. Right. It, it's not necessarily mm. the cream of the Australian crop in, in New Guinea at this present time. Right. Um, so we, we talked about the Owen Stanleys, and this is important because this is going to dominate a, a great majority of our conversation today. Um, you know, they were considered impassable virtually impassable by the Australians. Um, General Douglas MacArthur, who was seated in Brisbane, he and his staff also thought them to be impassable, which we're going to revisit that in just a few minutes. 32nd Infantry Division, God bless you. But the, MacArthur thought that, you know, there's no way that the Japanese can put people across those mountains. You know, the Australians were in the same way. And yet again, the Japanese, much like they did uh, to the Brits, Prove that wrong by doing that very thing. They did come over right. those mountains, Although, much to their suffering. Right. And so there's a backstory here, too. Um, there's a guy named Masanobu Tsuji, who we've mm -hmm. referred to in previous episodes. Uh, he was a real character. He shows up all throughout 1942 in various interesting places, Malaya, uh, the Philippines before the death march, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Suji rolls into 17th Army headquarters uh, in mid-July and basically tells the commanders there in Rabaul, hey, Imperial GHQ back in Tokyo is really concerned about uh, the Allies building up in Port Moresby. And instead of doing a reconnaissance 
over the Owen Stanleys. We're just going to, you know, rustle up these two infantry regiments called the South Seas Force. And we're going to put them in Buna and we're going to go. And as a SOP, they flew a couple of zeros over that neck of the woods to see were there, is there a road in this place? And the zero pilots from their vantage were like, yeah, it looks like there's a road running from the coastline all the way to the village of Kokoda. Beyond Kokoda over the mountains, eh, I don't know, you know, but that was good enough. So they land this force in the end of July, and it turns out about a month later that it looks like Suji actually forged his orders to send this force into New Guinea. So these guys get in here and start, you know, doing their advance. They're reasonably uh, adept at sort of cuffing out of the way uh, the, Brit uh, the uh, Australian territorial forces that were there. They make it to Kokoda, and now the trail turns <laughs> to the left and starts going up, and they very quickly become disabused of the notion that there's any road here at all. Mm -hmm. There was only a track from Bunagona to Kokoda. When you get to Kokoda, that track basically turns into a goat path, and it's vertical. Mm -hmm. And that, that's that's going to spell the doom of not only the Japanese that are there, but the Aussies as well as the Americans yeah. that are coming soon, too. Do we yeah. know, you, you talk about Suji, and we've had a discussion offline about him a couple of times, and he was not not a nice guy. No. But uh, do we know why, in God's name, he would have done what we think he did? Well, um, again, there's this sort of tradition within the Japanese army of what they called leadership from below, where, you know, juniorish officers would kick off operations that were way above their pay grade and then basically dare Tokyo to call them to heel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at the, the, the Mukden incident in Manchuria where they detonated a bomb underneath a Chinese railroad. That was a group of fairly junior officers within uh, Kwantung Army that made that happen. So, you know, there's this long tradition then in the Japanese, Japanese Army of doing this kind of stuff. And Suji was very much the kind of cat who would do that sort of thing. I mean, this is a guy who burned down a geisha house in Manchuria that had, you know, brother officers in it because he felt that they were, you know, being morally, uh, you know, backward. So. Yeah. Not a nice cat at all. And yeah, mm -hmm. kick, kicks off this operation, it seems, pretty much on his own recognizance. So the operation, as you say, does kick off. The Japanese, despite all the obstacles in front of them, and we see this repeatedly, especially in the early part of the war, yeah. you know, they are consistent. They, being the Japanese, are consistently underestimated by not only the United States, but literally everybody on the friggin' planet that yeah. they cannot do this that oh this will never happen that if they get there if they get there you know they're going to be wrung out they're not going to be able to do this and that and the other thing but they consistently do it so through the month of july and august and into that later part of the summer into september to a point the japanese are pretty close to their objective of port moresby they they are about 30 miles ish give or take a few here or there yep from the, they can see port moresby they can or, see or the searchlights yeah. they can see the searchlights from the air field there yeah so yeah they've pushed all the way up the northern slope of the mountains they've gone through templeton's crossing they're going down the southern slope and during this time not only have they managed to push infantry up this thing, they've managed to drag along a pair of 75 millimeter field guns, which give them a firepower advantage over the Australians that they're facing. And so they get down to a ridge called Ira Biowa and manage to take it from the Australians. But then the basically the last ridge, but one before they get to the flatlands in front of Moresby is a place called Imita Ridge. And they run into both uh, not only the territorial divisions, but at this point, 21 Brigade and finally 25 Brigade have been put into this fight. The Japanese are starving. They are falling apart from malaria. Um, the Japanese, before they kicked this operation off, figured that to keep 5,000 men in supply on the other side of the Owen Stanleys was going to require 35,000 human porters. Okay. Every bean and bullet has got to be carried over these mountains by hand. And so they're at the end of their logistical tether. 
They're facing three brigades of Australians with some 25 pounders. They're looking at a brick wall. They just can't go on any further. And because of what's happening in New, uh, in Guadalcanal at the same time, 17th Army comes down with the proviso at the end of September. You guys just hold in place, mm-hmm. which is impossible. Yeah. Uh, just to rebaseline the Guadalcanal timeline, Savo Island's already happened. The landings right. on Guadalcanal have already happened in parallel with all this. That had to have been a distraction. Yes, absolutely. Well, so yeah. It, yeah, at this point, the Japanese can't hang on. They're they're receiving about 550 calories per man per day. They're starving okay. to death. They're gonna die. It's either mm. somehow managed to push forward and capture Moresby. Or they've got to go all the way back over the mountains to Kokoda, and that's what they end up uh, deciding to do. And they're just in oh. desperate shape at this point. To, to MacArthur the- was, was certain that they couldn't do what they had just done. Was yeah. is there any record of how he reacted to the news that they had poorly <laughs> crossed? What's that? Poorly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you know, by the time the Japanese make it to Amita. Um, you know, MacArthur has been sending communiques back to Marshall saying the Australians won't fight, yeah. which is asinine, yeah. asinine. crazy. Yeah. It's asinine. Um, he, he's looking, MacArthur's looking at this. And, you know, I was reading about this this morning, as a matter of fact, he was so upset. He being MacArthur was so obsessed with the fact that he wanted to, and, I, and we're not going to turn this into a MacArthur bashing episode. We've already done that, but we're going to hit where the hits deserve to be placed. Um, he was so obsessed with the fact that he wanted to lead the first American offensive in the Pacific, the yes. first successful American offensive in the Pacific, yes. that that he was highly irritated at the fact that the Marines were actually doing well on Guadalcanal. <laughs> and, and to the point where he was he was throwing the Australians under the bus Yet, and we'll get to this, and I don't want to get sidetracked too too deeply. But he was saying, to your point, John, that the Australians were not fighting, they were, or they were not fighting well, that they could do a lot better with better leadership and all this other stuff. That he had no inclination as to what the hell he was even talking about. Literally, no clue what he was referring to. He'd never seen the territory. He'd never seen the forces that were staring at the Australians. He'd never seen the Australians. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, he does later, never but not at this point. Yeah. Not at this point. And the fact of the matter remains is that he was completely clueless as to the actual situation on the ground. And we're going to revisit that numerous times throughout this conversation. Yeah, but I remember, back- Seth, in our Nimitz episode, we said that Nimitz's focus was on the war. MacArthur's focus was on making himself look good. Well, and, and, and then that that's that's proven out here example. numerous times. Now, back to back to the Guadalcanal uh, portion of what I wanted to say is that the defeats by the Marines at Edson's Ridge specifically is what caused or one of the reasons that caused the Japanese to hold their offensive here at the bottom of this, well, on these ridges here, is because the Japanese were under the impression, maybe John, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Japanese were under the impression that once they took over Guadalcanal, the people, Kawaguchi's people specifically, that were on or that would be uh, decimated at Edson's Ridge were going to be plopped onto New Guinea to help them out and to uh, reinforce them and basically give them fresh legs, if you will, for the continued advancement on the Port Moresby. Once the Japanese get the order, and it is an order to go get back get over there that had to be that had to be absolutely devastating to these guys who had humped all the way across the mountain fought several battles and won yes and it just that had to rip their souls out yeah there's a there's a quote from one of the japanese uh survivors that you know they were weeping tears of blood when they had to turn around understand in some cases they had actually brought their wounded along with them over the mountains yes. in anticipation that they were going to be capturing Moresby and that there would be better medical facilities for these guys once they had it. Now you're facing up to the fact that I'm starving. There's no way that I can carry my buddy back across the mountains. I'm going to have to kill him. And that's, and that's exactly what they do. There, there's, it, I mean, not to it, every man, but there's a lot of Japanese wounded and sick Absolutely. That are that are killed by their own people because the 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 people that are well, which frankly yeah. there probably weren't any, they're not any, can't yeah. hack it. They can't right. hack it. 
and they're and starving just, to death. I mean, yeah. so at this point, the Kokoda track turns into a charnel house, mm-hmm. you know, just festooned with bodies. Another thing that's going on at the same time is that uh, Fifth Air Force under General Kenny uh, has perfected the first batch of their A-20 strafer aircraft, which are extremely fast, powerful machines. And so you see, starting in about October, when this retreat is starting to happen now, that A-20s and bow fighters from the Australians and P-40s are just going up and down the track. And anything that they see out there moving, they're just strafing to pieces. Mm -hmm. This means, in turn, that a lot of the native porters who had been working for the Japanese are like, we're out of here, you know. So now it is Japanese troops that are being forced to do the porter work to try to keep that frontline force that is retreating back in supply, except the Japanese porters are also starving, of course. So mm-hmm. it's a nightmare, this yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Sorties were still being flown out of Port Moresby, right? Were these some of them or were they flying all the way from Australia? No, they're, they're coming out of Moresby. Yeah, but Moresby and, and, both, and Milne Bay as well. Milne Bay, yeah. yeah. Milne Bay. Um, so beginning on September 26th, the Australians, now backed by regular Australian troops, yes, are beginning a counterattack up the Kokoda Trail, trail track, tra- track trail, whatever you want to call it. They're they're forcing the Japanese back. They do not know. They're not aware that the Japanese are in full retreat because at this point they are essentially in full. They have a rear guard, but they're yes. essentially are in full retreat back across the mountains. The Australians are not aware of this. However, it doesn't stop them. They're they're pushing their way back up through the track and they're eliminating whatever Japanese they're running through or running into rather. Yeah. And so much so that 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 by uh, by November by November twelfth. Um, the Jet or the Australians have essentially eliminated most of the Jet, except for some pockets here and there, of the Japanese along the Kokoda Trail. Yeah. I understand too that the terrain here is extremely linear. Um, you know, we got mountains on either side of this track, so there's no real ability to do big outflanking maneuvers or anything like that. It is frontal head bashing the whole way, particularly at at Templeton's Crossing, which is extremely constricted in a lot of ways. Um, So yeah, this is really bloody fighting with with the Japanese rear guard as they're pushing them out. Even as the Australians are successfully pushing the Japanese out, up and out, MacArthur is still fussing that the Australians are not performing as quickly or as efficiently as he would like yeah. and again and i'm not making this up this is all going back to the fact that he wanted to be the first one to lead the first successful operation in south pacific regardless of this he decides long before this to send in an american unit to help out the australians because he feels that MacArthur does that the americans can get this job done that the australians are not pulling their their weight to the best of their ability and that the United States army and it's untested national guard division, the 32nd infantry division, God bless their souls are yeah. going to come in and save the day. Right. Let's give a little background on the 32nd. If, if, if we, if we can, we're not going to dive into their roots, but we'll just talk a little bit about them. And these are boys that for the most part are national guardsmen. Now I work at camp Shelby, which is a national guard base and, and, the National Guardsmen of 1941 are not the same National Guardsmen of 2023. Right. Completely different people. For all the right reasons, that 2023 is a better way to go. But the guys in 41, 42 that make up the 32nd Infantry Division, these are guys that joined the Guard because they needed a meal. You know, they they were not overly, not to say that they all weren't, but they most of them were not overtly patriotic. They weren't doing this to save blueberry pie and mom they were doing this because they wanted to have three square meals a day and the united states army national guard could provide them with that yeah they were also filled with a lot of draftees and these are some of the guys that were you know from the 1940 draft and some of the first peacetime draft in american history these are the guys that are coming in you know so these are untested people the 32nd id is sent to of all places my home state Louisiana, where they are sent to, I can't remember the first camp that they're sent to, but it's eventually they go to Camp Livingston in Louisiana, where they do a lot of their training. 
Now, if anybody's ever been to Louisiana, and I know all three of us have, it is rife with swamps. Quite a bit of time for polk. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah. <laughs> rife with swamps and mosquitoes and snakes and alligators and all kinds of things that one would particularly run into in New Guinea. Does the 32nd actually say again? <laughs> not mountains. No, not, not mountains. Not mountains. Yeah, right. Anyway. But, but the but the rainfall in the swamps and all that jazz. Yeah, does the 32nd, take. does the 32nd do any training in those swamps in those areas of Louisiana? Short answer to that is no, they don't. So when long story short, when the 32nd Infantry Division, who was initially slated to go to Europe, by the way, is immediately turned around and rerouted and they send them their sorry asses to the Pacific. They are completely untested. They go first to Hawaii and then they go to Australia. Where they, they do, do no training in Hawaii either, right? No, no. And they don't do really any training in Australia. They do marching in Australia. Well, I understand but, that a lot of that is just driven by the sheer length of time it takes to move a unit across the Pacific. These guys have spent a lot of time on ships. That's three why weeks. they're not getting the training. Yeah, yeah, right. Three weeks. And even when they get there, General Harding, the 32nd Infantry Division's commander, commanding officer, is under no false impressions that his people are ready to go into combat right now. He is fully aware that they are not ready to go into combat. They need basic infantry training, really, more yeah. than anything else. They need to learn how to fight. And this is not a bashing on these people at all. It's not their fault. They were thrown mm -hmm. into the fire long before they were ever ready because – Douglas MacArthur wanted to throw American troops into the fray, and these were the guys that were available, for better and or the worse. The commanding general had to know that they had no logistic support either. Both the CG and MacArthur had to know that, didn't well, they? Went, <laughs> well, and and two, their their mission that they were originally slated for was essentially defensive in nature. Again, the mm -hmm. bargain that we had, you know, cut with the Australians is we're going to send two of our divisions to defend Australia. Uh, so it wasn't really anticipated that they were going to be performing offensive maneuvers in a place like New Guinea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they haven't got they haven't got anything that they need that even to the point that the uniforms are not, um, you know, correct colored and they end up home dyeing their own uniforms with, you know, a darker green kind of camouflage color. It's yeah, the whole thing is a mess. It, it's 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 pathetic. And, and and to your point about the uniforms, that is 100 percent true is that these guys were using dye. They were using vehicle paint to 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 model their uniforms in, in a camouflage pattern, which if you've ever gotten paint on a T-shirt. You know what that does. Right. It keeps it from breathing. Yes. And, and, and these uniforms before the end of their hell, before they even really get started in New Guinea are rotting off of these people's bodies. Yes. They, they they are bereft of of, of mosquito nets. They yes. don't have any insect. Oh, well, they do have insect repellent, but they find out later it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, they don't have adabrin yet, or very little, very yeah, not enough. They don't have enough quinine to to ward off malaria. Uh, I mean, I could go on berry berry. There, there's all kinds of things that are just staring yeah. them right in the face that are that is just going to kick them right in the right in the stones. Not the least of which, Bill, to your point. General MacArthur decides to leave their divisional artillery back on, in Australia because under advisement by General Kinney, his buddy, General Kinney has a statement. John, I don't know if, if either of you have ever heard this, but General Kinney said to Harding, to General Harding on the 32nd, you don't need artillery. The only artillery in this theater flies. Right. And he was referring to his Air Force, which did good work, but yeah. infantry needs artillery support. But it wasn't just the div artillery they left back. It was right. battalion and battalion level artillery as well, right? It was, it was, it was dang, dang near everything. everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. just to you know, sort of level set again for the for the listener, everything that the U.S. Army does in this war was built on a core of the infantry artillery team. That was right. the the backbone of U.S. Army tactical doctrine at the divisional level. And so for 32nd ID to be going into combat without so much as a single 105 millimeter howitzer uh, is just, it just beggars the imagination. You can't get it yeah. done. So mm -hmm. You could accept that they wouldn't have armor, but you can't accept that they wouldn't have artillery. Right. Basically, your, your infantry rifle company uh, right. at that point, nothing more. Right. That's it. That's it. Let's talk about, before we start getting into the, Sugar pulling. Let's talk about the terrain 
and 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 some of the and we've we've touched on it briefly, but let's let's dig into this because this is what propels the decisions that are made that affect these the fighting men here in the in the coming minutes. The place is I mentioned it in the in the opening is rife with disease. If if there's a tropical disease, if you look up tropical diseases and you get a list of about ten of them, they pretty much all of them are on New Guinea at some point. Yeah. And I mean, it's literally, it's everything. It's malaria, it's beriberi, it's dengue fever, it's scrub typhus, it's, uh, God, I don't know. I mean, it's to go typhus on, and yeah, every, go dysentery. It, it's funny, you should mention this. I was just having uh, drinks the other night with a guy whose dad was a medic in New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And when when this guy was a, was a kid, his dad saw an article in the paper talking about, you know, the 10 most deadly diseases on the planet. And he cut the article out, and put check boxes next to all of the ones that he had gotten on New Guinea. And it was like six of them. Um, so, yeah, the, it, it's just an absolutely horrible environment from a physical standpoint. And any non-native is going to be sick there a tremendous amount of the time. Mm -hmm. um, by the time we get to the tail end of this campaign, the mountains are long behind us. Once, once the Australians have pushed out of Kokoda and further north, now we come into this triangle of terrain around Bunagona, San Ananda, which is basically a gigantic mangrove swamp. It's very low lying. You've got big stands of, of kunai grass, which is razor sharp. Uh, the vegetation is extremely heavy. And as you get closer to the shoreline, uh, the water table is, you know, like about six inches below your feet. Yeah. And in many cases, it literally is a mangrove swamp where you're fighting in what could be waist high water. So you can understand then that being able to control the limited number of trails that are above that water table that lead into the inhabited areas of this sort of triangle of fortifications, that's the key to the entire battle which means that all of the combat then gets channelized along these, these trails, which are, of course, going to be covered by every manner of field fortification that the Japanese can bring to bear. And, and they do that very thing. Yeah. To, to give the listeners, going back to the disease thing real quick, I got some numbers that I have to spit out because these are unfreaking believable. Unbelievable. It's, 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 it's a crime. But hear me out now. Bash, better, try again. Battle casualties, battle casualties for the Australians and the United States 32nd Infantry Division numbered around 7,700, give or take, in early 1943. Disease casualties numbered 37,360, with 27,892 cases of malaria reported. That's just reported. Yeah. Mos uh, uh, it is estimated somewhere between 85 to 95 percent of allied troops in the area. This is 1942-43 had malaria at some point. And uh, let's be clear. Once you have malaria, it doesn't just go away. It's not yeah. it's not a cold. It doesn't just go away. Five men were hosp hospitalized for disease for every one man that was hospitalized for a battle wound. Yeah. Let that sink in the old brain bucket for a second. Yeah. Right? And, and that also means that in many cases, these individuals who are on the front lines are terribly sick. Mm -hmm. And the need for infantry was so acute that unless you had a fever, in some cases of over 103 or 104, you couldn't, you know, there was no medical reason at that point for you to be, you know, sent back from the lines. Mm -hmm. there, there's a story in one of Eric Bergerud's books, um, of this guy who he was an infantryman at, at Buna came down with, with a fever, black water or something like that. His fever was 106 degrees, which for that neck of the woods was even a whopper. He went back to the, the aid station. And one of the things that the medics tried to do was, you know, give him a series of questions, you know, to sort of evaluate the state of his, of his mind. And this guy's account, he's like, I thought I was doing pretty well, you know, answering their questions. And the one medic turns to the other and says, he's crazy as hell. Can, you know, get him, get him onto a cot. And let's get some ice on him, you know, because he was just burning up. God. So a lot of these soldiers, both Japanese, the Japanese are yeah. even worse off than we are. Yeah, because they don't just, have quinine to the, to the degree that we do. That's right. Is, They're just burning up with fevers and desperately, desperately sick all the time. 
Yeah. Let's talk about the logistics and the supplies real quick. And again, we've we've danced around it, but let's talk about it at length here if we can. And this is this is pinned on really on one cat. And I'm talking about the allied supply situation. We've already talked about the Japanese. Yep. The supply situation for the allies, and I'm talking Aussies and US, of course, is simply criminal. It's absolutely criminal. And there is one man to blame for this, and it is General Douglas MacArthur. It is improper planning by his staff and him, for that matter, did not allow for the terrain, did not allow for the monsoons that happen. You know, there's a monsoon season, but even when it's not monsoon season, it's raining, you know, you know I could all the time give a moniker why. But anyway, yeah. uh, he didn't give any consideration to, frankly, anything that these troops might encounter and did encounter in the jungles and in the mountains of New Guinea to the point where of critical shortage were ammunition, medical supplies, and food. Because yeah. General Kinney swore to General MacArthur that I can resupply these men by airdrop, which technically to a point you could if the men could get to the supplies that you actually dropped to them. Right, right. Which they often could not. Yeah. I, I do have to say in Kenny's defense that, you know, as this campaign continues, the techniques that are developed sure. for doing airdrop supplies just continually improve. We get Absolutely. better and better at it. But there's no way that you're going to keep what is in essence, uh, you know, a, uh, a division plus. You've got two Australian brigades and you've got, you know, 32nd Infantry Division there with two of its regiments. You got you to use ships to do that. Yeah. And the Navy is extremely wary of operating on the northern coast of New Guinea. Uh, it's uncharted. There could be coral reefs and whatnot. And so what you've got is this motley assemblage of, in some cases, sailing ships, you know, coastal lighters and schooners and whatnot that are being loaded up with supplies in Milne Bay and then moved up the northern coast of New Guinea to someplace close to Boonagona and then being offloaded. It's just the most rinky-dink way of doing logistics you can possibly imagine. It's, it's We mentioned in the episode for USS Wahoo and Mush Morton that they, when they were tasked with reconning Buna, they couldn't find a nautical chart for it. They used an <laughs> Australian tourist map or something like Atlas, that. Like yeah. Something you would get out of natural... National and, Geographic. And you, can hardly, you can hardly blame them for that because, I mean, even now, yeah. Buna is like 12 houses. You know, this is just a tiny yeah. place on this, mm. you know, largely indistinguishable jungle coastline. You know, you couldn't really tell it apart from anything. So I sort of get that in one respect. Mm -hmm. But it really well, shows I mean, you what's happening at the end of 42. You got these two militaries that are, you know, just barely touching fingertips in this incredibly remote location. It's really hard to get stuff in here. But the thing, suddenly the lack of uh, artillery makes sense because it significantly reduces the logistic burden, right? <laughs> it, it's yeah, but again, if you're if you're going to go up against these fortifications uh, that the Japanese are building, you know, you, you got to have this stuff. Uh -huh. And the and these and this this is a no, I'm joking, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. This, Sorry, yeah, no, my, my bad. I didn't get, didn't get the sarcasm there, but yeah. But this is a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about next, which was intel. You talked about the Japanese fortifications, John, and the, they, and I'm talking about the area around Bunagona, up up around San Ananda, places like that. The Japanese defensive fortifications, because as I said, as we said, Japanese are in full retreat over the mountains. And they're pulling back to the Boonagona, San Ananda area. They are building defensive fortifications like honest to God bunkers, not, you know, just a hole in the ground, but like, you know, bunkers that are reinforced with logs and sand and 55 gallon drums full of sand to absorb concussion and shrap. I mean, these are like, yeah, these are very serious defenses. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty small. I mean, you typically what you would do is you would dig a trench four by eight feet, about two feet down. You've got lined with uh, these barrels, as you say. I put a, a roof of coconut logs over the top of my head. I've got firing slits that are maybe six inches high above the top of those barrels I can see out. Mound the top of that whole thing over with dirt and maybe a, you know, a couple sheets of, of you know, sheet steel, some more logs, whatnot. And then with all of the detritus you have left over, these coconut tailings and whatnot, you just sprinkle that on top of 
uh, of this fortification because within about two weeks, given yep. the heat and humidity here, all of that stuff will sprout and grow. And now you have this bunker that is completely invisible to anything that's coming down the trail until you're within like three feet of it. If you're so lucky. You, if you're lucky. Yeah. So you have this the network of bunkers years. and all of them are covering the entrances, the back yeah. entrance of the bunker that's in front of them. So you've got these interlocking fields of fire. You've got trenches that have been dug from bunker to bunker. It's just a maze. Mutually uh, supporting is the term. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. impervious to any sort of mortar fire. Uh, you've got to have a big shell to take one of these things out. Which we don't have. It sounds like Correct. what was done on Terrell, but in Terrell, you didn't have the water table at six inches. Bingo. So you were yeah. standing in water as you're right. doing this. So to, to that end, the intel that was given to the allies was, shall we say, piss poor. Yeah. And, and that... And that is, that is putting it very, very mildly. General Sutherland, who was... May his name forever be cursed, yes. Mm, yeah, <laughs> who was Mac's chief of staff. We've talked about him before. He was, shall we say, a tool. He... Uh, this is the unauthorized pod. <laughs> indeed. Yeah, right. He, he, he classified the Japanese fortifications, what he thought they were, as, quote, hasty field entrenchments. Right. It should be noted that Sutherland's only experience, quote unquote, and these are my words, against the Japanese so far consisted of getting beaten to a pulp <laughs> by the Japanese in the Philippines. So he had literally no yeah. reasonable amount of experience to have any kind of judgment over what he was or was not looking at in terms of aerial photography, which, by the way, he was hardly getting at all because yeah. hey, we don't need that. Yeah. We got well, American but, troops. We're gonna get it done. And and the climate is terrible and it rains 29 days out of 30, and there's often cloud cover, so aerial reconnaissance is not real easy to get in any case. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. It's so most yeah, most military commanders put little Japanese flags when they want want to battle. Sutherland used American flags on the side and on this tally board <laughs> as he destroyed American units. Consistently. consistently it is the unauthorized history of that is correct wars. we but can say true. what we want That's but right. it's true though we're not making yeah. this up this is you know people are gonna go oh you're just bashing on my car through again no dude read a book it's the truth it's that's the way it is man yeah. god anyway you sound so, just like that guy seth like which guy? <laughs> the guy who complains about us bashing McCarthy. oh that guy yeah, yeah that guy, yeah, that guy. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, you know, just pulling it up again, big picture, I do think that MacArthur learned a lot of things in 43, 44. He did a much better job as a general this, then. But again, this. you know, the, my book project for the last umpt years has been a history of 1942. And in those 13 months from December 41 to December 42, his generalship was just terrible. Mm -hmm. And this is going to mm -hmm. be the final example of that this year. Yes, absolutely. He... Mac, as 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 the Australians are pushing in, and let's just fast forward a little bit. The United yeah. States infantry is yeah. there. Thirty second ID is there. We're we're on the ground. He decides to send one element of the United States thirty second infantry division over those very same Owen Stanley Mountains that he said that the Japanese could, could. not cross. Yes, which the They're Japanese crews proved that they could cross not once but twice. Right. You. What is it? To, I can't. Is it it's two Kappa two, Kappa Trail? Yeah, it's two um, one twenty six that he sends over there. Isn't that's it? correct. Yeah. And the the basic logic here is that the Kokoda track is so narrow and muddy and nasty itself that there's no way that you can put you know an American regiment on this track and still keep the Australians who are already there in support. So the notion was we'll find another track that parallels Kokoda that's a little bit south and we'll be able to outflank the Japanese and, and move these forces overland. So they find this track and they send this battalion up it. And oh, my God, this track is even worse than Kokoda, goes up over 8000 feet to get across. Um, there's a really good book written on this called The Ghost Mountain Boys. Uh, yes. You know, they go right past this one mountain and the, the recollections from the Marines there or the excuse me, the army so guys yeah. are just like it was dead silent. You know, you're up so high that if you moved, you sweat. But if you if you stopped, you froze. It was just an eerie, eerie passage. And 
this battalion came down on the other side of this trail wrecked destroyed as a fighting unit just by having marched (laughs) to 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 give the the viewers listeners a a, a taste of what they're taught what john's talking about here you're talking about guys who were you know in good physical condition i mean these are you know they're they're young yeah they're they're young dudes they're united states army soldiers they're not cream of the crop yet the 32nd id does prove itself heroically throughout the rest of the war but this Mm -hmm. is their first instance regardless of this these guys are not in horrible shape but by the time they get down they are because there were some instances where they would march march for 12 hours or more during the day and advance only a mile or two because of the trail if you want to call it that right the state of the trail to your point, John, you were talking about guys crawling, you know, hand over fist to get up yes. these trails. The United States Infantry was doing the same thing, trying to yes. get over the hump of this mount or these mountains. And it and it absolutely devastated these people by the time they get down to where they need to be to do the fighting that they're there to do. Yeah. They're in no physical shape to do it. Right. And of course, by this time, we have captured uh, an airstrip at a place called Dobadura, which is close to Bunagona. That's going to become a whole complex of airfields once we build it out. But Dobadura is a big enough strip that uh, we were able to then fly the rest of that regiment actually across the mountains instead of having to yomp them across the mountains. Um, so it, it turned out to be a pointless exercise in any case. It, you know, there, there's a passage in that book you're talking about, Ghost Mountain Boys, is fantastic, by the way. Great Anybody book. who it's it's awesome. But there's a passage in there where the guys, I forget. Um, can't think of the officer's name e company or g company's commander of 2126 they get word as they're about right at the crest you know after just getting their <laughs> yeah. behinds handed to them by this trail they get word that oh yeah by the way we can the rest of the division now. just got flown in there and they're like are you kidding me are you kidding me <laughs> you got to be kidding me yeah it's like man it's just terrible. hold that news till we get down okay yeah you know, right don't they, tell me don't that now that now Good gravy. Anyway, let's get to the fighting. Yeah. So there's a lot of nasty stuff here. Gona, San Ananda, Buna. Um, let's talk about Gona. Um, on November 16th, or yeah, it is. It's the 16th. The Aussies kick off that battle by crossing the Kumizi River, which yeah. is about 40 miles away from the targeted beachheads. Now, the whole point of pushing the Japanese out of here, they're pushing them towards the sea. They're eliminate or they're trying to eliminate the Japanese. Why? Because Buna and Gona is thought that area is thought to be by MacArthur's people, and he's not wrong here, that it would theoretically support any other offenses up the New Guinea coast. So this is where right. they're pushing the Japanese out, driving them into the sea. Um by the end of November, Japanese resistance had essentially been minimal in the Gona area. There was a lot of fighting there, and that's not to say that there wasn't. There was a lot of fighting in the area. However, as the 32nd elements of the 32nd that were assigned to the Australians in this general vicinity approached the Gona area proper, resistance stiffened and casualties mounted. Progress slowed to a snail's pace until December when Gona was finally cleared of their 900 or so defenders. Now, this goes back to another point in which I, I wanted to make is that uh, pre-battle intelligence said that, you know, there were only going to be, you know, three to 400 Japanese in this area. They were all sick they because, you know, they which were they sick, were. which they were. Right. They were. What MacArthur's, I shouldn't, I, I don't want to pin this on him because this is not his fault, but what MacArthur's staff's intel failed to pick up is that several hundred Japanese, I'm not talking two, I'm talking what, John, like 900, almost close to a thousand yeah. guys. Yeah. A bunch of dudes. Are, are trekked in there by boat, and these guys are as fresh as daisies. Right. And exactly. these are the people that the yeah, Aussies... They're bringing, they're bringing in troops by barge from Leh, which is another uh, large Japanese base that's further west in the near the Finchhaven Peninsula. And so, yeah, they, they're they moving those down by barge at night and, and dropping them off. Now, we say fresh as daisies, of course, within a week right. or two of their being landed, they're all going to have malaria and dengue fever, too. Um, But the point of the matter is that with the type of fortifications that they have built for themselves, it doesn't matter how sick you are. I mean, Mm -hmm. you have a perfect defensive position in which to sit your feverish body and extract maximal, you know, American and Australian casualties as they come at you. So it's it's a bitter bunker by bunker kind of fight 
where we've got to pry them out of these bunkers, usually using satchel charges or just getting lucky and, you know, literally putting a machine gun, you know, a Tommy gun through the firing slit and, or a grenade or something like that. But it is really up close and personal. Th- this is where, you know, much like on Tulagi, where the Marines are first running into these Japanese cave fixture fortifications, yeah. where they have to figure out uh, what is it, you know, on the job learning on how to get these people out of these fortifications. Right. And it would have helped a whole hell of a lot had we had artillery to drop onto these fortifications. Would it, would it have destroyed the fortifications? Maybe, probably not. You know, I've, but it I've, provides cover. Yeah, it provides cover. That's that's for sure. And you know, 105 millimeter shell. That's a big kaboom. Sure. Um, you know, but so we didn't have it. You know, no, so I mean, it, it goes. It. And and to your point, and, and to your point too, Bill. You know, the U.S. Army is built on fire and maneuver, fire and maneuver, fire and maneuver. Yeah. Well, you can't maneuver very much in a mangrove swamp. Right. In a fire up a path, <laughs> which yeah. means the only solution to these bunkers, yeah, should be firepower. And in this case, it's going to have to be delivered by air infantry, which is a terrible way to go. Yeah. And it's just it, it becomes a bloodbath. You know, Gona is is not the easy cakewalk it was thought it would be. San Ananda is worse, in my yeah. opinion, because the Aussies are pretty much almost. Well, yeah, they essentially are by themselves in San Ananda and they are just slugging it out with these Japanese the same way the United States are doing, the infantry is doing, you know, in these close quarter combat where you walk up a trail and you stub your toe on a Japanese bunker because you didn't see the sucker. Right. And then it murders the first four or five people in your section. And now the guys at the tail end of the line have got to figure out how to deal with this thing. Mm -hmm. I I think a word is is due our Australian allies at this point, uh, just regarding how splendid their troops were that, the Australian army throughout this conflict had a real reputation for extremely high unit cohesion. They were aggressive patrollers, really good field craft in general. So these are, you know, 21 and 25 brigade are absolutely crackerjack units with, you know, very high morale troops, but they too are extremely tired having, you know, fought this campaign across the mountains before they even get to this place. Uh, so this is a, a terrible environment for everybody. Bill, I don't decision. remember where it was, but didn't MacArthur expecting them to fail pull like half of the 32nd Infantry Division out from, wasn't it, was, I can't remember where they were supposed to attack and then reinforce the Aussies. Was it Santa Amanda? Yeah. yeah, we, yeah. Yes, ahead, John. that's right. Good. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, and you're hundred percent right, Bill. Yeah. So MacArthur believing that the Aussies needed help, which to a point they did, because it's not necessarily that they were not doing what they needed to do to what we've been saying this entire episode is that they were sucked dry by disease, yeah. by lack of supplies, even though we're on the offensive, there's still lack of supplies. These guys are worn that they're, they're just worn slap Down out, a, man. Yeah. Down to a nub. Yep. Yeah. And they don't have a lot of artillery themselves. So no, no, nothing, nothing that not what they needed. I I should say not what they needed. So to your point, Bill, yeah, the 26th infantry regiment or part of it is sent to reinforce the Aussies in these, in this series of attacks. Um, As these attacks are unfolding and we can talk about this now, the attacks are being made against these positions in Buna, Kona, San Ananda. They're not progressing with the speed and, and rapidity that MacArthur wanted. So as a result of that, MacArthur climbs up Eichelberger's back, General Eichelberger. You're going to hear his name for a great deal of the rest of the Pacific War when it comes to U.S. Army. But this is the first time you hear his name here. He climbs up Eichelberger's back and says, you need to get these people moving. And the only way to I'm talking about the 32nd, the only way to get these people moving is remove their company or move, uh, remove their commanding officer, General Harding. What is yeah. y'all's opinion of this? Because Eichelberger has no clue what the hell is going on here, and he yeah. immediately knee jerks and pulls Harding out. Yeah. Um, he's, he's succumbing to the gl- gra- great and glorious Oz, isn't he? Um, ironically positioned in Oz. Uh, yeah. so, you, so you pull out the one general officer who actually might know what's going on, who's laid eyes on and all of that. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I, I can see both sides of it. I, mm-hmm. I do think that uh, by this time, you know, 30 second ideas is in, isn't a, a real pickle. Uh, they are not necessarily the best led at all points in the in the batting order. So I do think that at least some of those battalion commanders were going to have to go. I think that I think that Eichel Berger probably needed to be there in person to do more direct supervision That's of Harding point. and help him. But of course, Eichel Berger is under terrible pressure from MacArthur. I mean, MacArthur tells him, you know, you go up there and, you know, either win or don't come back alive. Yeah. So he actually said that, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Either win or don't come back alive. Don't come back alive. Yeah. Is there another American leader who made a similar <laughs> who gave a similar order? I'm uh, going through my Rolodex and I'm not coming up with any. Uh, it, yeah. 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 It's, it's a bad situation. And this is going to destroy the personal relationship between Harding and Eichelberger who were friends before this and have known each other for a long time. And this is it. They're done. Uh, mm-hmm. Harding will never, you know, will never speak to Eichelberger, uh, for the rest of his life. I, I seem to recall. And, you know, Eichelberger then personally leads an attack, uh, in within the next couple of days and just gets gets his tushy handed to him uh, and very quickly comes up against the realities of the terrain and and realizes, okay, you know, maybe yeah. what I was being told by 32nd IDs officers actually is pretty much the straight dope. Yeah. And that 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 was my point is that he is under orders by MacArthur to relieve Harding. Mm-hmm. He goes in there and he, he being Eichelberger, goes in there with this fire and brimstone, you know, and just cuts heads off left and right. He removes Harding. I think all the battalion commanders are relieved. All, yeah, I think all of them. Actually right. I'd have to Did go MacArthur back. say to him something like, I don't care if you have to put sergeants in command of battalions? Well, Eichelberger had come armed with a couple of his own aides as well. And so he mm-hmm. inserts them into some of the regimental commands um, and then is promoting other officers from within the ranks. But yeah, it's it's a mess. Um, and that's not the first instance that you've had this, you know, during this battle, you know, General Blamey had, had done mm-hmm. a similar series of head choppings. He's the Australian uh, head commander, had done a lot of shuffling within uh, seventh uh, division and some of their battalion and regimental command or brigade commanders as well. So, yeah, th- this campaign has not uh, has not been good for making the careers of a lot of gentlemen. Let's just put no, it that way. No, and and Eichelberger, you know, to his credit, to your point, John, once he gets in there and he sees the terrain, and he sees the way the Japanese are fighting, he sees the way his that his people are trying. But I mean, he's running. They're running yeah. into some stiff defenses. Yeah. He sits back and he goes, oh, man. Yeah. yeah. I've just mm. been. Yeah. I've been handed pretty much the worst infantry assignment in the world. Yeah. At, At this point. point anyway. Yeah. Yeah. To his credit, he stayed. Eichelberger stays on the front lines. Yeah. He doesn't do the general thing and goes back to the rear with the gear. He nope. stays on the front lines with his people. What now are his people. And he is present. You know, he is present and that does a lot. You know, we've talked about morale at, at several different times, you know, like with the Navy and everything else when uh, seas off Guadalcanal. It's the same thing here. Yeah. You know, if you got no, a I guy am- who's given orders and he's doing the same thing you're doing and he's taking the same shots that, that you know, they're being yep. thrown at you and he's living in a mud hole too. That does a lot. And yeah. once Eichelberger realizes that, yeah, maybe I was kind of a jerk. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and, he starts to 32nd ID doesn't love him, but they start to respect him. And that's a big thing. Right. That's a big Dude, thing. I'm trying to remember in the European theater, there's that story about, was it General Snuffy Smith where some, you know, private says, says to him, not realizing who he was, I don't know who's in charge of this thing. Anyway, <laughs> Snuffy says, I don't know who he is, but whoever he is, he ought to be shot. And of course it was him. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. Eichel, Eichel like Berger, I, yeah, I have a fair amount of respect for Eichelberger, and he does start trying to do some things to solve some of the problems that they're having. I mean, um, among other things, they do finally get a 105, a 105 into the theater by breaking it down into pieces and stuffing it into the belly of a B-17 and flying it over the over the mountains and into Dobadura. But of course, you got to get shells for this damn thing, too. And, you know, those are in very short supply. So you do start seeing some sort of improvised uh, improvements. But again, this is an army that solves its problems with firepower. This division should have, um, I believe, 24 105s and probably eight 155s at its yeah. disposal and should just be pulverizing, you know, these fortifications. Mm-hmm. And it's got a single shooting iron, you mm-hmm. know, and that's just not going to get it done. No. And it's, and, say again, Bill? A single artillery tube, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is a classic infantry fight. And, and they do, they being the Americans and the Aussies, we they do get air support from Kenny's Yes, they, they do provide air support and it is very valuable. And it is, as you'll see later on in some of these fights, it does, you know, kind of help decide the day. Right. But you still need that divisional artillery. You still need that regimental battalion artillery. And they just, they, 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 they ain't got it. They ain't got it. They ain't got it. So anyway, as we're progressing through this on December, now we're, we're in the December now, the Americans and the Aussies are still pushing through slowly, albeit slowly, but they are pushing through to their final objectives. Um, on December the 5th, Eichelberger orders an all-out offensive. That's it. Get this over with. Kick them out. Um, initially, and this is by the entirety of the 32nd Infantry Division and the Australians on the Boona Front, um, this attack, as I said just a minute ago, unlike the other ones, are is supported by air support. Right. Uh, these P-40 Warhawks that are coming through here do help eliminate some of these Japanese positions. They do help soften the area and the infantry does advance to a point. Um, Flanking attacks on the Japanese meet stiff resistance and that does initially halt the allied advance. Enter this one gentleman named Platoon Sergeant Herman Botcher. This guy is a bad dude right here. There's a monument to him on New Guinea to this day. Is that true? I didn't know that. Yeah, Yeah, this is a bad man. He is H Company, 126th Infantry Regiment. He is, as I said, he's a platoon leader. He leads his platoon in an assault that penetrated through the Japanese lines all the way to the sea after initially being pinned down. Wading across a creek under constant mortar fire, Botcher led 12 volunteers through to the Buna Beach. He stood up through hand grenades at the enemy, knocking out several pillboxes en route, and was able to drive a wedge between Buna Beach and Buna Village by himself. Because, yes, I said he had 12 people, but he gets up, he tells his people, you guys hold here. He gets up and does this on his onesie by himself. Botcher, one eardrum broken by mortar blasts, his hand cut by shrapnel, held that wedge by himself. He ordered his men to dig in at once on the edge of the beach, which became known as, appropriately, Botcher's Corner. He and his men fought against enemy attacks from both the village and the fortified beach area, which resulted in the death of over 100 Japanese soldiers. This is similar to Mitch Page, John Bassalone kind of stuff on Guadalcanal, except he ain't a machine gunner. He's a rifleman. Yeah, right. And and this is something that you see throughout the fighting, too, where you've got these pathways that are snaking through the uh the mangrove swamp here right Mm -hmm. and the australians would do this occasionally too that if you could manage to you know wade your way through the swamp undisclosed and then sit your own roadblock down behind a series of japanese fortifications and block them from taking supplies up to those fortifications you could now uh essentially cut that group off from supply and just let them, you know, they would starve to death and, and you could, you could get rid of those bunkers more easily. So there's this kind of constant chess game of, can I put my group, you know, behind the lines, if you will, in a, in a position. And yeah, that's exactly what you, what you see here with Botcher. Mm -hmm. He's awarded for, for those who want to know, he was not awarded the medal of honor for this. He's awarded the distinguished service cross and he does survive this event uh, he unfortunately is later killed in action on the Philippi- in the Philippines in right. 1944. But 
this to your point, John, this this happened several times. There's three or four roadblocks that are named for different people. Yes, who were, who various were there. intersections of the track and you know what have you. There's you know some pretty harrowing stories that come out of this, and I'm I'm trying to remember the exact uh, book that I read this in, but one of the chaplains I believe within 32nd ID, I think he had kind of a mental health crisis, and this guy became infamous for sneaking up, uh, you know, behind Japanese bunkers, would get up on top of a bunker with a grenade or a satchel charge or whatnot, and then would say, repent and be saved before shoving the satchel charge through. Holy cow. Right. Mm. So this gentleman had seen a few too many. This guy. Yeah, I mean, had seen a few too many of his of his charges uh, wounded and killed in the course of the combat here and, you know, picked up a rifle and did his own thing. So this was desperate combat. Uh, mm. Just it's a terrible, terrible place. Yeah. By, by, by the end of January, Buna is in. I would say beginning of February, technically, Buna is in our hands, but that's fast forwarding the point. Yeah. Um, mm. As we're getting to the end of December, you know, the, the attacks in these areas are starting to die down. Uh, we're running into more stiff and stiffer and stiffer resistance. Not uncommon with any other time yeah. we tangle with Japanese heavy emplacements. Um, on Christmas Eve, Eichelberger launches one final massive push against the Japanese positions. And this is a series of attacks that are going through. And it's not just the Eichelberger. It, it's, it's the 32nd ID. It's the Aussies in and around, again, still fighting in the San Ananda area, which has yeah. become a bloodbath over there. Yeah. It, it Probably, I don't have the casualties in San Ananda off the top of my head, at least I don't no, think I don't either. But they, I do know that they were more significant than they than they were for the Americans in Buna. I do know that. That's correct. Yeah. The Australians have now managed to get a uh, a small group of light tanks in here as well. They're operating some M3 uh, stewards, and those are going to be useful in in breaking some of these positions as well. So we are seeing some shipping coming in. Again, schooners and whatnot are uh, offloading stuff on the beaches near. Uh, nearby this fight but yeah we're still not getting the logistics that we need mm -mm. no and yeah, it's the north the north beaches right not correct not over the correct yeah there's no way obviously to fly that stuff in so yeah we're running supplies up from milne bay uh, yeah. into the area it's it's mm -hmm. just a slugfest it's a it's a it's an old-fashioned infantry slugfest as all as all this yeah. really is yeah and i hate to jump backwards but you just mentioned milne bay John, didn't that occur at the, around the same time as the Alligator Creek? The yeah, Battle so, so there was a, about? yeah, uh, that's correct. And and for the, again, for the sake of our readers, Milne Bay is down at the very tip of New Guinea, the eastern tip of the isle, and there's a, there's a bay there and like an air, yeah, yeah, a fork. It, it looks like, you know, somebody took a giant ax and just whacked the mountain chain in half. It's one of the most malarial spots in the world just sheer cliffs going down to a thin strip of muddy ground but we had three airfields there and the japanese wanted those so they came with an assemblage of special naval landing forces at the end of august brought a couple of light tanks with them as well pushed the australians back from their landing point until the australians were literally sitting on one side of strip number three uh and the japanese were on the other and uh, the Japanese tried charging them three times over this one evening and were destroyed. Uh, and mm -hmm. to the point that there were literally body parts falling out of palm trees the following morning. It was such a, such a bloodbath. And the Japanese then retreat and are retrieved and taken off that island. But yeah, that fight happened within 10 days of Iki's uh, dismemberment at Alligator Creek. And I really think that those two engagements are incredibly important because up until this point, it was an open question as to whether or not the Americans and the Australians could field infantry forces of sufficient quality to take the Japanese infantry on toe to toe, you know, because we certainly couldn't do that in places like Malaya and Burma. And yet at both of these locales, the Japanese were handed decisive defeats as a result of good quality infantry forces backed up by a lot of firepower that's the recipe right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. anyway yeah, throughout yeah, the war. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad I'm glad we covered that because I agree. Yeah. This is the these are little precursors to the battles that are going to come. Yeah. But, but they are there were it was yet they to be have, determined. It's the Prince Guadalcanal at Alligator Creek and yeah. Australia in Milne Bay. Yeah, um, they have outsized so. importance. Uh, you know, they're not huge actions. These are a couple couple battalions apiece, but right. but they demonstrate that we have the raw material to get it done. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the big thing for for, for Tinaru River, Alligator Creek, whatever you want to call it on Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. is that it proved to the Marines who were untested. Right. Yeah, we can do this. We can, we can, we can beat these guys. These, we can beat those guys, guys down aren't all day long. Superman. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Exactly. Meanwhile, back at Boonagona. Back at Boonagona, Christmas Eve, mm. Eichelberger launches the final, well, one of the final assaults to eliminate the Japanese and push them into the sea. And they're close at this point. I mean, they're close. They yeah, pretty much really... push the Japanese within, what, 600 yards it's a really tiny strip of land at this right. point that the Japanese are still holding. And the, the physical condition of the Japanese now is just catastrophic. It's appalling, yeah. It's, it's hellish. Uh, in many cases, the Japanese are building ramparts out of the corpses of their deceased. Uh, the field hospitals are just a house of horrors. It is, yeah, it, we're really talking Dante's Inferno kind of scenes coming out of the, this final pocket of, of troops here. Mm -hmm. And I want to mention one other guy because the guy, the the listeners and viewers of this show seem to love the personal stories, and this guy's yeah. another. This guy's another bad dude, and this all goes into this this event surrounding Christmas Eve. Guy named Kenneth Grunert, Thirty Second Infantry Division. Dig this, and this is straight from his Medal of Honor uh, citation. In the midst of an assault that was only 150 yards away from his final from their final objective. Grunert and his men came under intense fire from two hidden Japanese pillboxes. Advancing alone, Grunert, Grunert eliminated the first pillbox with grenades and rifle fire, killing three Japanese defenders single-handedly. In the assault, he was severely wounded in the shoulder. He bandaged his own wounds under the cover of the pillbox he eliminated. Right there, that's pretty tough right. stuff. Yeah. And then made his way to the second pillbox, refusing an order to go back to the aid station, saying he would not leave his men. Point this. These guys, 32nd Infantry National Guard units, these guys are mostly, not all, mostly from Wisconsin and Michigan. Yeah. These are people that they knew one another. Not yes. only, well, duh, they know one another. They're serving. No, no, no. These guys grew up with one another yeah. in the same towns or at least the very same yeah, right. yeah. These are in some cases lifelong friends. Yeah. Kenneth Grunert's act. Go ahead. I was just gonna say it's very common in, in these National Guard units to have, you know, this company comes from this town. And it's yes. I, I don't want right. to say it's a social club, but these guys were out, you know, one one weekend a month, they're out exercising together. So say what you will about their training, there's a fair amount of social cohesion here within a lot of these units. Take her away. And, and to the point that this is the kind of action that these guys consistently performed, maybe not to Grunert's level. This is a little special, obviously, but they were willing to sacrifice themselves almost thoughtlessly because they're helping out their best friends, right. cousins mm -hmm. in some yeah. instances, you know, neighbors, next door neighbors that they've known since they were, you know, nine years old or whatever. It, it, it makes a difference. Important. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Gruner would yeah, not leave his. Stuff. What's that? No, oh, good. I was going to say, forgive me for bringing this point up now, but I am sure that there were similar stories and Victoria Cross awards to Aussies oh, during this battle. Sure. Oh, God, yeah. We don't have the same kind of access to those citations that we do the American Medal of Honor, but we don't want to downplay no, right. the heroism mm -hmm. of our yeah. Aussie soldiers as well. Oh, those those guys were. Harder than woodpecker lips. But, <laughs> Correct. Correct. <laughs> back to Gruner. Back to Gruner. He would not leave his men. And this is the point. Moving mm. to the next pillbox at a low crawl, Gruner attacked the pillbox under intense machine gun fire. As he got closer, he threw grenades that forced the occupants to run out of the pillbox, allowing them to be cut down by Gruner's riflemen that were behind him. 
Shortly thereafter, realizing the threat had been eliminated, Grunert's men advanced towards his position. As they did, he, Grunert, was repeatedly shot by Japanese riflemen hidden in the grass. Grunert's actions inspired his men and allowed his platoon to be the first to penetrate to the beach at this section of the line and successfully split the Japanese defensive line in Buna. He would award. He would later be awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. So this this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. You know, when the thirty second ID gets into the field, like we said, they were green as grass, man. I mean, they they had virtually, well, they didn't have any of the proper training, they didn't have any of the proper equipment, with the exception of the M1 Garands and BARs and Thompsons that they carried. That's it. No artillery, no logistic None. support. Right. right. But by the end of this action, as worn out and sick and debilitated as they are, they had proven themselves trial by fire, literally. Yep. You know, They had proven themselves that they were more than capable, that National Guard units, specifically the 32nd Infantry Division, was more than capable of carrying the load later on in the war. And they do. I mean, they, they yep. this unit sees a lot of action from yeah, here on out. You know, I mean, they see com comparable action to the 1st Marine Division, you know, for the rest yeah. of the war. I mean, they really do. And meanwhile, you know, you have to say, too, that from the Australian perspective, Kokoda, that campaign really is the defining moment for Australia in this war as a whole. I mean, this was a really, really scary time. And, you know, they had no idea that they were not on the invasion itinerary for the Japanese. So, you know, in July and August of this year, when they see uh, Lieutenant General Horee's force advancing across these mountains, I mean, this is a real hair on fire emergency for them. And by the time, you know, we now get into the December, January uh, timeframe, you know, they push the Japanese all the way back across these mountains and are successfully prosecuting this attack uh, to, to eliminate, you know, those pockets. So, this, this, I think, arguably is the, the most important campaign that the Australians fight during the entire war. Certainly in the Pacific. Yeah, certainly in the Pacific. Yeah, I don't think that's arguable so, at all. And there's an, the Australian general you mentioned, um, I, I'm, his name Blaney. is slipping my mind. Yeah. Doesn't he give like a quite a memorable speech at the end of this oh my action? God. Yeah, so, so there's a whole series of controversies around that that... Uh, Blamey, first of all, relieved uh, Brigadier Potts, who is the commander of, of 21 Brigade, um, sends him to other duty without even allowing him to say goodbye to his officers or to brief the guy who's going to end up taking over for him. And understand that Potts later will be given another brigade and will go on to be quite a fine commander for the remainder of the war. Anyway, so Blamey yanks Potts and then gets up in front of the brigade after Potts is gone. And this is I forget the exact date, the, they have stopped the Japanese. So it would have been in September, late September, early October that this, that this talk is given. Blamey gets up on a box in front of 21 Brigade and basically tells 21 Brigade, well, you were you know, shoved across these mountains by an inferior force and then makes a comment about rabbits having run that the troops within the brigade interpret as you know, him saying that we ran away from the Japanese. You know, he's lucky he got away literally with his life uh, because the, the men were just molten with rage in the words of one Australian. Um, yeah, it was a real slap in the face uh, to this unit. Blamey, yeah, remains uh, what you, one would charitably call a controversial figure, uh, particularly because he was not the kind of guy who could then stand up to MacArthur Right. Um, you know, to some of MacArthur's excesses. So yeah, it, it's a mess. It's a real mess. To, to that degree, talk about standing up to MacArthur. General Eichelberger, who we, you know, initially said, mm, probably didn't do the best thing, but then learned on the job. Yeah. Once he gets there on the battlefront, this is, you know, several months back now, he realizes pretty quickly that the reason that the infantry is in the shape that they are in is because of the lack of planning and preparation by MacArthur's right. staff. He realizes, oh, so all this stuff that I was being told by old General Doug is in fact malarkey because this is a situation of his making. At that point in time, Eichelberger, who was a MacArthur fan, goes burp, burp. and says, yeah, you know what? 
Doug and me are not like this anymore. Yeah, we're we're not no. partners, as I say down in South Louisiana. We we are no more. We are no longer friends. Right. And and it their their relationship at that point from that point on is tenuous at best. Yeah. MacArthur, you know, is gracious enough to leave Eichelberger in command of his troops because he realizes that Eichelberger is actually a very good commander. Right. But they. Well, and the other thing that's going on here, too, is that at this point in time, MacArthur's, you know, sitting on the veranda of his house yes. in Port Moresby, mm -hmm. which was a 45 minute flight across the mountains to Dobadura. Mac could have gotten on that plane anytime he wanted to and gone up front and seen for himself what the hell was going on here. And he never did. Nope. So, again, mm -hmm. if we contrast our two theater commanders here, we got MacArthur on the one hand. And we've got Halsey on the other who goes to Guadalcanal and gets shelled, for Heck, God's sake. Nimitz went to Guadalcanal. Yeah, more Nimitz. Well, thank you. <laughs> Correct. So, yeah, my biggest beef who was it that had was, to, Go ahead. Who had the temerity to speak to the press and right. get his name in the papers? <laughs> he was a brilliant ad man. Uh, yeah, man. that's one of my biggest beefs is that the, the, during this time, during the war, MacArthur and is nothing more than a glorified corps commander with mostly Australians under his command, and yet mm. never bothers to go get the skinny on what's going on up front. And furthermore, builds a staff organization that is, is completely devoid of Australians. It's just, it's contemptible. Yeah. So, and the yet, Batan gang I, is what they're called. Yeah. yeah. And yet, I, I just rewatched um, They Were Expendable, the movie. Right. Or, John Wayne played Lieutenant Junior Grade. He plays a two-star admiral in another World War II room in harm's way. <laughs> in this one, when when they show the PT boats, um, you know, burying yeah. MacArthur's family right. out of the Philippines, John Ford treats him with Christ-like like. reverence, yes. where the the yes. sailors are almost bowing down to this godlike figure who boards their PT boat, forcing, by the way, one of the sailors to carry his baby. Right. <laughs> Other sailors asking him to sign their bodies or their hats or something like this. And it just makes me sick. Yeah. And I know that movie, that movie actually, was released, I think, in 46. The, the one time I saw that movie was actually sitting in Rich Frank's house, and we both had, you know, an adult beverage of some sort. And we're just like, can you believe this? You, know, just, you anyway. want to throw the drink at the TV? Yeah. I know. And John anyway. Ford in 46 <laughs> still believed that this is true yeah, to put it in the movie. Yeah, there are horrible. a lot of people that still do. I mean, yeah. anyway. All right, we should we should we should move this to a conclusion by God. Yeah, let's 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 put a bow on this bad boy. All right. So casualties, which is the final tally of any battle. And, and when is when is the final uh, the Japanese come in with barges and actually manage to pull out some of their garrison just before it collapses and another group actually makes it out overland as well. They do. They they, they pull but out. Yeah, what's the final date? It's 1,200 people that they evacuate, by the way, the Japanese, yeah. estimated, you know, roughly, yeah. roughly. Casualties in the fighting for Buna, Gona, San Ananda had been staggering, to say the least. Australian casualties were 3,400. These are battle casualties. Mm -hmm. 3,471 with 1,204 of those killed in action, yeah. as, well, as well as 66 missing in action. American strength in the actions that we're talking about here, Buna, Gona, San Ananda, these are the guys that were attached to the Australians, the guys that were pushing through under Eichelberg, all this whole thing, totaled to 13,645 men. This is the strength that we had in that area, 32nd Infantry Division. Of these, 787 were killed, 2,172 were wounded, and an mm -hmm. astonishing 7,920 were reported as, quote, sick. For a grand total of ten thousand eight hundred and seventy-nine, that is out of out of a force of not quite fourteen thousand. Yeah, that's yeah. absurd. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Battle casualties for the Japanese roughly estimated around seven thousand killed in action. Yeah, uh, with the further twelve hundred, like I was saying, being evacuated ish, twelve hundred ish. But to your point, ten thousand over ten thousand guys out of a you know just under fourteen thousand man unit is debilitated in some way shape or form yeah that'll um, give you an idea of the fighting conditions yeah so you know there's many reasons why the 
obviously we win, you know, but but there's many reasons why this battle was so costly, not the least of which was lack of intel, lack of supplies, you know, the logistical nightmare, the terrain. I mean, it, it was it was a really it, it has a lot of similarities to Guadalcanal, the United States experience on, on in Bunagona compared to the Japanese experience on Guadalcanal, if you really think yep. about it, with the supply issues, the medical issues, the disease issues, you know, starving. There were Americans that were starving. You know, it's 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 very, it's eerily similar when you look at it. Yeah. Um, I found that these words that were written by General Eichelberger, Eichelberger are very telling. He writes of Bunagona after the war. He says, quote, Buna was bought at a substantial price in death, wounds, disease, despair, and human suffering. No one who fought there, however, hard no one who fought there, however hard he tries, will ever forget it. I am a reasonably unimaginative man, but Buna is still well, at least he's honest. But but Buna is still to me, in retrospect, a nightmare. This long after, I can still remember every day and most of the nights. Unquote. It's incredible. Yeah. And that's PTSD from the command. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's from the command. That's not even one of the trigger pullers. That's one of that's the commanding general. So, you know, we'll address the New Guinea campaign throughout. You know, we want to, we're going to do, you know, something on, on Kenny's Air Forces. And, and they, For they, sure. they, they served heroically, you know. Yeah. And, it's, and there's a lot to talk about there. But this is our first taste of infantry combat in New Guinea. And it's, it's certainly the biggest, you know, in, in terms of this. And, I, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, go back and forth. Well, what was the worst place to fight in World War II? That's a common topic of discussion. And, you know, you certainly have contenders like Stalingrad, uh, for instance, sure. you know, Guadalcanal, Peleliu, all of them are there. And they all have their sort of special evil awfulness about them. For my money, you know, from end to end of this campaign, when you throw the mountains in as well, I can't think of a worse place in this war. Just the combination of terrain plus disease is just so awe-inspiring mm -hmm. that it, it, you really have to wonder if there is another place on earth that was as bad to have to fight a battle. Mm -hmm. I mean, just all the respect to Guadalcanal. <laughs> sure, know? sure. Yeah. But I mean, just the disease factor alone for crying out loud. Yes, Guadalcanal is known as Malaria Island for a reason. You know, 80% of the 85% of the first Marine Division had malaria. But I mean, the numbers that we spit out at the beginning of this, it's it's jaw dropping. Yeah. Unbelievable. Was it anyway. Robert Frost's poem, Death by Fire, Death by Ice? By Ice. One, one is bad, the other one's just as nice. Um, I can't. <laughs> It's been 40 years since I read that poem, but yeah, with you're talking Stalingrad or New Guinea, death by fire, yeah. Or death by ice. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. As yeah. I as I say in my draft manuscript, you know, New Guinea was was the reminder that Mother Nature could create uh, arenas of martial torment every bit as awful as you know men could create in a city. So yeah. anyway. That is definitely, definitely no lie. And I feel that that is a pretty good place to wrap unless you gentlemen have another thing you want to I'm throw good. in. Yeah. Good. Right. Thanks right. so much again for, for having me. It's always fun. Always a pleasure, John. Always yeah. a pleasure. And with that, we want to thank you for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. Also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast, and please do subscribe. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Perrin, and I want to thank you very much for listening. Bill? Yeah, this is Bill Toady, and the, and the morning we recorded this uh, episode, we passed 200,000 YouTube views. So thank you to all of our listeners. For that, we'll try to continue to give you great content that's worthy of your attention. That we will. And John, thank you again, as always, and we will definitely see you again in the future. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. All right, guys. See you all next week.